July 2021 is going to go down in sports history because it was the day that college athletes were able to start making money off their name image likeness, also known as NIL. Now, this is only a temporary situation and there's no permanent or federal legislation that's been put in place. But what does this mean for the money side? What does this mean for the marketing side? What did this mean for the brand deals that are coming and already are in place for these college athletes? That's why we're talking to Jonathan Jensen, a former executive at sports marketing agencies of Omnicon and Publicis Group, who now works at an associate professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and works in sport analyzing and sports marketing. He's coming to tell us about the analytics and the future of sports marketing, how these brand deals and athletes will work and change the idea and trends in sports marketing. So make sure to give this video a thumbs up or a thumbs down because it's your thumb and let's go ahead and get into it. People are kind of describing the past few weeks as like the Wild Wild West, Shark Week, like everyone's diving in. So as someone who worked in the industry for a few years, when it goes to these athletes, they're signing with brands like Open Doors, Athleticus, Influencer, Dreamful Sports. Would you say that that is a good route as someone who would reach out to these athletes, that that is something that would interest you to go to them instead of going to the brand directly? There's not a um, one size fit all solution right now in terms of, so how does how does a student athlete get matched up with a brand? Um, you know, it's happening um, a variety of different ways. You mentioned the, the third parties like Influencer and Open Doors, they're essentially, um, you know, aggregating um, they have already re they already have relationships with brands so um, that they work with um, generally not major brands um, you know like uh, Coca Cola and AT and T you know lesser known brands um, that tend to focus on social media in terms of um, you know TikTok and Instagram and Twitter um, rather than a brand that's going to put you on a you know a television commercial or up on a billboard student athletes have the right to be uh, to representation to have a marketing agent um, in these deals. So they may have an agent that may have already established relationships with brands. So they can also get a deal, you know, through through an agent, um, you know, which could be someone that represents them, uh, or it could be more of a broker type situation where someone might try to just broker a deal and say, well, you know, I, I have this brand that's looking to partner with student athletes, um, you know, and, and they may reach out to them and, um, and generally in that situation, they're going to probably take 20 to 25% um, of the student athletes revenue in that situation. I'm seeing a lot of um, different uh, brands and third parties just uh, reaching out through social media. Um, you know, they're, they're interested in student athletes who have, who have an already established brand, meaning they're out there on social media. They're um, wanting to promote themselves. You know, they promote how they play in the field. Um, maybe some of the things they do off the field. And um, everybody can see that. Originally, the NCA was going to hire a third party who um, every single um, NIL deal that a student athlete got was going to go through that, um, that group in, in, at the N NCA um, headquarters in Indianapolis. And they were going to review every single deal. And they were going to basically ensure that it stayed within kind of these guidelines that they were going to establish okay, well, you're the second string guard at the University of Tennessee, so you should not be making more than $1,000 for a um, you know, post, or they're going to look at the follower count and basically set up kind of some industry standards to ensure there wasn't a, re a recruiting inducement. Well, that didn't happen. Um, the NCAA um, decided not to, not to do that. Um, you know, things got away from them. And um, so because of that, there, there are no guidelines. Um, there's no there's no kind of guidelines saying, well, you know, you can only make from this to this, or you can only sign this many deals. What that third party group was going to do originally is they're going to take like data from professional athletes and they were going to establish some um, benchmarks based on that. Well, sponsoring a, a professional athlete is very different from sponsoring a, a current student athlete. Um, so in my opinion, it kind of would have been a, a garbage in, garbage out situation where the data that they used to set the, and establish the guidelines was not going to be good data and it wasn't going to be generalizable to student athletes who have never been able to have a 
partnership before. These athletes have their own brands before they could even do this. Like you had creators like Destroying on YouTube. You have now Ryan Travas is now a super mega YouTuber who started off as a track athlete and had to not monetize his channel. And the same as Destroying, and they had to really choose between which one they wanted and they ultimately chose YouTube, what I guess turned out to be the greatest decision for them. But now that that's not an option, do you think more as someone who was going into the marketing industry, do you think the creative economy and now the sports marketing kind of economy are starting to blend as one now that these college athletes can monetize from their channels and social media accounts? You know, sport marketing has always been creative. Um, you know, going back to, you know, Spike Lee's ads with Michael Jordan. Yo, it's the Michael Jordan flight school. Learn how to increase your hang time. Learn how to dabble defenses. Learn how to wear really great sneakers. Learn how to sign lots of autographs. Learn how to stick your tongue out during the game. Learn how to play golf during the offseason. Learn how to make the all-star team. Learn how to score lots of commercials. For details, call us. Operate and stand up by now. Michael Jordan flight school, not affiliated with America. You know, those were... Um, you know, revolutionary. So it's always been that way where brands have been thinking creatively about how to bring the partnership for, uh, to life. I think what's different now, um, and you hit on it, is that um, instead of the brands and their advertising agencies, the creative folks who are working with them, you know, you know, sitting in a room and coming up with the ideas on how to activate the athlete, a lot of the ideas and a lot of the creativity is coming from the athlete you know, him or herself. So you have kind of a reverse situation where um, the athlete is the one, you know, being creative, coming up with stuff, um, and, and, you know, they're empowering themselves to, you know, do things that are kind of out of the ordinary and get attention. Um, and then the brand is essentially just coming and kind of um, following along for the ride, right? Um, you know, made through could be product placement, uh, or what we call brand integration, in terms of integrating the brand, you know, into say a TikTok video or something like that, um, you know, or they could be kind of leveraging some unique talent or skill, um, you know, that the that the the athlete or in this case, the student athlete has um, and, and um, kind of leveraging it that way. I feel like a lot of people who are fans or fans of certain athletes that are seeing this, they are kind of like afraid. They're just gonna be like, oh, these athletes, these student athletes are just gonna throw their name on whatever comes their way, whatever knocks down their door. and even though we're really fresh into it, it's only been a week of this approved thing. Now you see these athletes that are making actual, I don't want to say good decisions, but you're kind of shocked at the partnerships they're doing. Like you have Trey Knox, who's working with PetSmart now and his whole entire Instagram account was showing off his dog and how much he loved being a dog dad. So partnerships like that, that are starting to work together, I feel like that's really good for not only for the current college athletes that are in the NCAA, but the ones in the future, because the NCAA kind of sees this like, oh, they're not, you know, signing with Jimmy Bob's chip restaurant and they have no relation to that. So that these are true and authentic bills that are working on here. It does seem as if the vast majority, you know, of the partnerships are, are very small, very minor, um, you know, with, with not national brands, um, you know, with more, more local brands. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the national brands that currently spend a lot of money, um, on college athletics, um, you know, because they realize that, um, you know, people who, people watch college athletics on TV and go to college athletic events, they're generally a younger consumer that is, um, very difficult to reach nowadays, um, you know, through traditional advertising because they probably don't have cable and they may not even watch regular television, um, and they may not have a car, so they can't watch billboards. They can't, don't see billboards. They certainly don't get the newspaper, or read the magazine, right? But they're going to college sports events. Um, and then you have the, the the alumni who have, you know, a more um, a higher disposable income um, and have money to spend, you know, on things like tech and cars and insurance and credit cards. Um, you know, they all went to college. That's why they're going to college sports events. Um, and only only a third of America even went to college. Um, so uh, they're a very enviable demographic as well. So typically why brands are sponsoring college sports is that it's the best of both worlds. You hit that young um, consumer who in a lot of respects is an influencer and who are out kind of um, uh, telling their friends, you know, what they should buy or consider to buy. Um, and then you've got the, you know, the older demographic that um, 
has a disposable income and is going to buy, you know, more products, going to consume more, and college sports hits both of those. Um, but what we're seeing right now is, is it does not look like the brands that, that spend the most in college sports. We're talking about Coca-Cola, um, Capital One, uh, AT&T, Wells Fargo. It does not look as if a lot of those brands have jumped in yet. And essentially a lot of the, a lot of the partnerships right now are, are, you know, kind of with smaller, you know, social media based companies, but that, that does kind of make sense because these, you know, big brands and corporations have kind of a longer lead time. You know, they have approvals, they have creative processes. Um, they're very careful about what type of situations they put their brand in. They're just more cautious. So it does make sense that, um, and I'm sure they're, you know, they're, they have a lot of plans and they're thinking about how student athletes can be leveraged as part of their overall marketing platform uh, on college athletics, right? So I think you will see some things in the fall when college football starts, but it just takes time. Student athletes are really, for these brands, like a Coca-Cola who has, Coca-Cola has deals with more than 90 university athletic departments. And they also, you know, have an NCAA corporate champion partnership. Um, so they're spending millions and millions of dollars in college sports. The student athlete piece of it is really just an activation platform meaning they have this, this program that already exists that leverages college sports to try to sell more Coca-Cola essentially and, and make people feel differently about the brand. The student athlete piece is just a way to activate that. It's a way to kind of bring it to life and communicate to the end consumer, hey, um, you know, we're a fan of college athletics just like you. You know, it helps make the brand more relatable. And you know, we're, we're supporting you know, student athletes who are out there killing it you know, both on and off the field, right? Um, and, you know, and, and whatever they do, whether it's social media based or, you know, I, I could see Coca-Cola doing something uh, similar to their Olympic platform where, you know, every time there's an Olympics, you know, they have a group of say six to eight, um, you know, different athletes across, um, you know, both male and female across a bunch of different sports and they celebrate those athletes. Um, they also have, you know, Paralympic athletes that they sponsor as well. Um, I could see Coca-Cola doing something similar, you know, selecting six to eight different, um, uh, you know, college athletes across uh, different sports. Um, you know, they'll probably have a football player and they'll probably have a basketball player, but, you know, they'll probably also have, you know, a field hockey player and a women's soccer player. Activation port nine to ten, that's turns out to be the most expensive part of a of a deal or a sponsorship deal. And now that with you have these college athletes with their own brands, kind of like Haley and Hannah Cadaver, the twins from Fresno State University, they signed a deal with Boost Mobile and Pros for Nutrition. They have that's estimated to be accumulated over the time of the deal that could get up, up to $3 million. And as you see deals like that, that shows kind of like in a way how you can cut that deal in half because they could just... I don't want to say throw their TikToks in there that are kind of famous and show them dribble in a ball, but that's that's an easier way to get it done than having to bring them to a studio, run out of studio, shoot a video, do all those kind of things. You know, when you when you have um, you know student athletes like women basketball players just kind of doing tricks on the court and kind of practicing and doing what they do, again, it's a little bit authentic. It's just well, this is kind of what they do on their normal life and. Um, and it's less staged. And I think, you know, particularly the younger demographic, that's kind of what they're looking for. You know, they, um, you know, they've been to the puppet show, they've seen the strings, they don't want to like a highly produced, um, you know, commercial, you know, they're more interested in kind of quick, you know, really quick videos that will just, you know, give people a glimpse of, you know, into someone's life. It's a good way to go about it at, you know, at this point. Um, I would, I would be careful about the size of some of these deals. You know, one of the dirty little secrets in um, the sports marketing uh, world is that um, you, these deals are always far uh, uh, lower than what people talk about um, because it uh, it behooves the agents involved to uh, have people think that the deals are much bigger than they are um, because then, you know, the next deal, if someone thinks that, that someone else spent $2 million, then the next person come around, well, I guess we have to spend $2 million to do this deal when really the deal might have been $100,000. Um, so it, it, the agent is never going to come out and say, yeah, actually, um, the brand was spent a lot less than they used, than, they, than people talked about in this deal. And then from the brand perspective, it also helps them to have people think that they spent a lot more than they did because then the, the chief marketing officer can go to 
the CEO and say, oh, did you see this article? They think we spent $2 million on this deal. You know, we only spent 500000 And then the CEO says, wow, you did a great job negotiating that deal. So, so every, no, you're not going to ever see any corrections in terms of the numbers out there. And, and generally when people, you know, try to put a number on something, it's, it's vastly more than it ends up being. Basically, um, you know, any deal that you see out there, if someone says, well, I did a $2 million deal, I would basically take like 10% of that and assume that, well, maybe maybe they paid $200,000. Athletes as a whole make um, a much smaller amount uh, from endorsements than people think they actually do. If you're not, you know, LeBron James or Cristiano Ronaldo, you know, you really don't make a lot of money from endorsements. It's just the way it is. A lot of people are fearing that this money will start to be perpetrated and pushed towards, you know, the male D1 athlete, the football and the basketball. But in your opinion, as someone who reached out to athletes and really tried to connect them with the brand, do you see that this will also kind of be an opportunity for female athletes to really get in the door and start making their way as so many other professional female athletes now? They signed deals with Savage X Fenty and Elizabeth Cabbage, and you have Megan Rapino who now is doing a deal with Victoria's Secret. Do you feel like this is kind of a way for women's sports to take it up as they, as a game, really struggle to get that viewership and that attention, but as individual athletes, that's more where they succeed. Overall, there's a lot of brands that are supporting gender equity. Um, you know, Visa is one, uh, Luna Bars is another one where they really see that part of their role is to make sure that um, they're allocating a similar amount of dollars to, you know, women's sport as they are to, you know, men's sport. Um, but also it's just, you know, good business sense. Um, you know, 90% of the household um, decisions are made by uh, the female in the house um, in terms of, you know, when you're going to the grocery store all the way to buying a car. So um, why wouldn't you target the decision maker, you know, who's actually making the decision by partnering with a female athlete? Now, female sports fans, as we found, you know, also support, you know, the NBA and want to watch male sports. So it's not as if, um, it's not as if female sports fans only watch women's sport, but um, it's a smart way to go about targeting them. You know, there's been a lot of talk about, well, you know, um, is it going to, you know, further a situation where, you know, on, only the big time, you know, uh, the, the student athletes in the big time sports are going to get the deals. And, you know, it's going to kind of um, be a situation where the rich are going to simply get richer. Well, you know, that, that situation already exists. I mean, on every college campus, you have a situation where really only the football and basketball players, both male and female, are getting full scholarships, full tuition remission, but, you know, they get a check in the mail for thousands of dollars every single month. Um, and that, that it includes, you know, if they, assuming they live off campus, that includes money for their food, money for rent, uh, additional expenses, and then then you have the cost of attendance check where essentially they're just getting several thousand dollars for nothing. So um, because the NCAA, has, they already um, pay to send student athletes back and forth campus to where they live. So they're already, you know, getting paid essentially. Um, and the student athletes in football and basketball are getting paid far more than the student athletes in, for example, baseball, where, you know, you have, say, you know, 50, 60 different student athletes all sharing 20 scholarships or whatever it is, depending on the sport. Potentially, NIL could, could serve a role in which student athletes who may not have a full scholarship uh, or may not be getting the same level of support that student athletes do in, in um, you know, more highly funded sports, you know, can help make up the difference, you know, by by partnering with brands. I do fear that, you know, because there were not kind of um, established guidelines as they originally had intended, that you are gonna have situations like the one we saw at the University of Miami, where the guy's just giving $6,000 to every single football player, even, even whether they deserve it or not. And uh, my, I'm anticipating that that deal's probably not going to be able to be happening because um, you know, they're going to turn that down because that when you give money to every single player, you know, even the third string offensive tackle, that's not, you know, a marketing platform. You know, they're not leveraged, you know, the second string guard that they're giving that money to. He, he's not, they're not using it as a marketing platform. They're essentially giving money to the Miami football players just because they're Miami football players. 
And that's one of the things that um, across all the state laws and the regulations that say that that's not allowed. Um, NIL has to be a legitimate marketing program in which the brand has objectives and they feel like, you know, partnering with a, an athlete can help them achieve those objectives. Um, you're not supposed to just give money to a football player because he's a football player. A lot of people, and especially a lot of universities, have startup programs like at UNC, you have Launch, you have programs at Florida State, Alabama, all over the country where they're trying to help their athletes and the NIO congregation. And people say that group licensing is starting to really grow up and expand in the community of NIL. And that's a way that they want their athletes to go is to start working with brands that are under the university. Do you see this as a emerging trend again? How can anyone determine a trend in a week? But do you see that that's kind of going to be a bigger route that people are going to go towards? Group licensing is an absolute slam dunk. Um, for this um, for, for a couple of different reasons. Um, and just, just so your viewers understand what we're talking about, we're talking about group licensing. That's a situation in which it, rather than one brand um, partnering, you know, one athlete, essentially they're spreading the wealth out to dozens of different athletes and essentially everybody gets the same amount, um, you know, which, which is nice. Um, so in the video game situation, you know, with EA Sports, um, when they had the lawsuit um, about um, using the player images in the a video game, they estimated, the lawyers involved estimated, it'd probably be about a $1,500 check to each individual athlete. So with the video game, what you anticipate happening is essentially, you know, thousands of football players will all get a check for 1500 and then their image will be used in the game. Um, but it's not just video games and uh, jerseys. Um, you know, I think people are kind of hung up on, on those things, but, you know, any student athlete, you know, can, can work with any licensee, um, you know, the collegiate licensing company, CLC has over a thousand different licensees that they work with flags, pennants, um, anything that, that you could put a logo on, you know, you could see a student athlete, um, on, so it really opens up, you know, opportunities um, across a myriad of different, you know, industries, right? Um, because the, um, the licensing industry in sports and particularly in college has just blown up, you know, it's not just, you know, jerseys and sweatshirts anymore. And originally, just a little bit of background, originally they were going to not allow that. <clears throat> I think because the, the NCA and the powers that be were worried that if they allow group licensing, you know, which typically in professional sports, what happens is you go through a players association, a union essentially, and, and you know, they, they um, t uh, aggregate all of the players' rights, and then you, you know, do a deal with the players association, whether it's Major League Baseball or the NFL, and then that's how you gain you know, access to the group license. I think they were worried originally that if they allowed group licensing, that then a judge later on would say, well, you, know, you have a group licensing program these student athletes must be employees. And obviously that for ver various reasons, they don't want student athletes characterized as employees. And numerous folks, you know, who are smarter than I am, like uh, Jack Swarbrick and Bubba Cunningham, you know, said, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And the number one reason is that group licensing is the only platform, marketing platform that a student athlete can do that doesn't take any of their time doesn't take their time away from classes, doesn't take their time away from training. They can essentially, um, you take a photo that's already been, you know, been done. They, they sit through hours long photo shoots at the beginning of the year as it is. And then they can use that photo on, you know, anything. And, and they have to, and they don't have to spend any more time. They don't have to go somewhere and sign autographs. You know, one of the things a lot of folks are worried about, you know, is that, um, you know, when you, if you have the option of, you know, taking a test or a quiz or, you know, getting $500 for posting a TikTok, you're going to post a TikTok instead of, you know, studying, um, which is kind of uh, penny wise and pound foolish because, you know, a college degree is worth millions of dollars. Um, you know, um, that's been proven over the, over someone's lifetime. So jeopardizing a, you know, $1.5 million college degree for a few thousand dollars, and then you don't end up Asking your class and you don't end up graduating. That's kind of a smart, or that's not a smart investment of time, right? Well, group licensing kind of takes that out of the picture because um, 
you're using the player's image in a video game and, and they don't have to spend any time to do it. And then, as I mentioned before, it also levels the playing field a little bit because essentially um, all of the student athletes in most situations would all get the same payment. They would all get the same check. So then everybody's kind of treated you know, equally, which is nice as well. Um, and then also student athletes can either opt in or they can opt out. Um, there's many licensing programs where individual schools decide, yeah, this, this product doesn't really fit with us. And so we're not gonna you know, opt into that group license. It's gonna be the same thing with the video game. Um, if the quarterback at Alabama doesn't feel like he's getting compensated at the level that he should be, for being in the video game, then he simply does not have to be in the video game. He can opt out and say, yeah, I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna participate. Um, so they have an option. Um, it's not as if they're gonna do that. And and Cleed's a licensing company, as I mentioned, um, you know, should be a great you know, option for these people. And and um, there's already been a couple other uh, groups like One Team Partners um, that has popped up that essentially is gonna um, help uh, kind of broker these group licenses. Um, you know, with the folks at Open Doors. And so, so it's gonna make it pretty easily for student athletes to say, okay, here's an opportunity. We're, we're doing, you know, a poster series, right? Remember the old posters you used to have on your wall of athletes? Well, um, a group could say, all right, we're gonna make, you know, 30 posters of student athletes. Do you wanna be on a poster? And then um, the student athlete can say, yes, I would like to be a part of that. Um, or they can say, no, I don't want, you know, uh, to be up on a poster and then and then essentially based on how many posters they sell and the athlete will get a, a small percentage of that it is small it's usually like 10 to 11 percent um you know if you're talking about like a jersey and if there's multiple you know athletes on it then then it'll get sliced up so it, it's not a large percentage but then they get basically get to share in the profit. The future of sports marketing is so up in the air. It's great for these athletes. It's great for us as fans. And let me know down in the comments below what athlete you would like to see partner with maybe your favorite brand. Thank you, Dr. Jensen, for coming on and telling us about the money opportunities in the NIL with the NCAA currently. You can check him out in the description below. I have linked all his social media accounts, LinkedIn, and some articles he has been mentioned in as well. Now that you know about the money potential in the NIL and the marketing opportunities, check out some of the videos I've linked down below, which talk about other money opportunities in sports. Have I looked over rookie NFL contracts, voidable contracts, and contracts in the G League. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell down below to be notified every time I post a new video, which are on Mondays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up or a thumbs down because it's still your thumb. And remember, don't be afraid to join the combo.